thousands of years from whom this land was stolen. This land is the territory of the Multnomah, Kathlamet and Clackamas, the Tualatin, Kalapuya and Malala, the Wasco, Cowlitz, and many other indigenous people who have known the power and beauty of the Columbia and Willamette rivers, lived here, raised their families, and built communities and traditions that live on. Together, we recognize their unbreakable connections to this land, and we honor the resilience of their ancestors and the hope of future generations. Thank you. Today, we'll hear from Multnomah County Chair, Deborah Kafori about the possibilities ahead for Oregon's most populous county. As many of you know, Chair Kafori leads a complex government with a jurisdiction that stretches from Bonneville to the Bull Run Lake, from Villa Ridge to Sovie Island, and all the points in between. Chair Kafori has served on the Multnomah County Commission since 2008 and as chair since 2014. Before that, she was a member of the Oregon House of Representatives and served for two years as the House Minority Leader. Chair Kafori will give a short video presentation that highlights some of what Multnomah County has been up to recently. After the video, Dr. Rachel Solotarev, President and CEO of Central City Concern, will join us for a conversation about how Multnomah County might spark new possibilities for Oregon in the coming decades. If you're not familiar with Central City Concern, it is a nonprofit that helps its clients overcome a lack of affordable housing, healthcare, and living wage jobs. It also works to remedy the effects of systemic racism, mental health challenges, chronic health conditions, substance use disorders, and time spent in the justice system. Dr. Solotarev started at Central City Concern in 2006 and has served as president and CEO since 2017. Before we begin our conversation, I need to thank a few people who made today's program possible. Thank you to Chevron, The Standard, and Wells Fargo for sponsoring our winter events. I'd also like to thank our supporting sponsors, Kaiser Permanente and Tonkin Torp, and our partners at Pamplin Media, X-Ray FM, and Merge Design. If you're ever unable to watch our forums, you can listen in via X-Ray stations, including 91.1 FM and 107.1 FM. Thank you also to Bobby Regan for all the work that went into producing today's program. Finally, I wanna remind everyone that you can ask questions at any time during today's conversation. Just email us at questions at pdxcityclub.org or tweet to at City Club using the hashtag State of the Possible. Now, it is my pleasure to welcome Multnomah County Chair, Deborah Kafori. Hello, I'm Deborah Kafori, your Multnomah County Chair, and welcome to the State of the County 2021. On a typical year, the state of the county is about ups and downs. This year, the state of the county is a state of emergency. We are here tonight to ask you for your help. We are facing a virus, COVID-19, a virus that before January, no one in this country had ever seen. On Tuesday, Multnomah County saw its first case. On Wednesday, I declared a state of emergency. That declaration gave us the ability to meet new and growing needs. It has now been extended four times. We mean it when we say it. Stay home if you are sick, wash your hands regularly, and assume this virus is in the community. Closing public libraries in Multnomah County like this is an extraordinary measure. It's never happened in modern times. As of today, we are no longer allowing social visitation at our two jail facilities to help prevent any further spread of the virus. We know there are seniors who won't be seeing their friends. We know that there are thousands of kids who rely on school meals. What do we want? Justice! What do we want? It? Now! As our country, and our community faced this once in a century pandemic, we also faced a much older and no less deadly pandemic of racism. And systemic injustice.
And then, as if we needed further proof of the climate crisis, in September, our state experienced extraordinary wildfires. We faced choking, toxic smoke that blanketed our community for a record five days and drove thousands of Oregonians to flee to Multnomah County. In a typical year, any one of these events would have been daunting. Together, they have been traumatic, overwhelming, and gut-wrenching. I'm Dr. Jennifer Vines, the Multnomah County Health Officer. But at every turn, I'm gonna to talk today about hand washing. Multnomah County was there. Today, I'm gonna to show you how to create a face covering. Make sure it covers your nose, mouth, and chin. Think about what supplies you might need. To educate. To track the virus. to distribute PPE, to provide safe shelter and housing, to organize meals. I have these moms and dads who say, we can't really sleep because of the burden that they have to carry, that they don't have income, they don't know what to say to their kids in the morning. That's really what keeps us going every day. To hold fair elections. Again. And again. To vaccinate. To appreciate our community. Good morning, everyone. And to carry on with county business. Planning an earthquake ready Burnside Bridge. Making Cornelius Pass Road safer. Opening a new school based health center. Passing the first supportive housing services levy. Passing the library bond and for the first time ever, approving the ballot measure Preschool for All, building the new courthouse. We've risen to every challenge, but the work of Multnomah County is far from complete. As you just saw, Multnomah County has stepped up in so many ways to help our residents navigate immense and cascading challenges. But as we stand at the edge of a post-pandemic world, we have the opportunity to reflect and to ask ourselves who can and should we become as a community after a year like this? And what does it look like to move forward? Because what the events of the previous year exposed to all of us beyond a shadow of a doubt is that the normal we had been living in was marred by inequities and injustices. So for all the wishful thinking about going back to normal, we can't go back to what was. To merely rebuild what was would be to deny the unforgettable sights, sounds, and lessons we've gathered in this past year. Instead, we have to use these experiences to imagine bigger, to propel us to build something better, to capture the sense of and our duty to the possible and not to the past. Our recovery from the pandemic and the years that follow must move Multnomah County toward a new place of strength, health, and hope. As the COVID-19 crisis proved, stable, safe housing is imperative to people's physical, emotional, and mental well-being. Without it, surviving outside is grueling, it's dangerous, and it's just that, a matter of survival. On any given night, 12,000 people in our community are able to lock a door behind them and go to sleep under a roof in their own bed because of our homelessness response system that combines housing with supportive services. 12,000 people who would otherwise be homeless if it weren't for that housing. 
But one look at the tents lining many of our streets tells us that this is simply not enough. However, the way our community responds to homelessness is at the doorstep of transformation. Last May, voters approved an historic investment in supportive housing services that will allow us to meet the challenges of homelessness for decades to come. This infusion of funds will drastically expand our response system, which gives people keys to a home and just as critically, connects them to the supports they need to stay in that home. The county's new Behavioral Health Resource Center will bring life-saving supports to people experiencing chronic homelessness in the downtown core. Once open, it will offer a day center, a safe 24-hour shelter, behavioral health treatment, and transitional housing. We are on our way toward becoming a community that is fully prepared and able to support every neighbor experiencing chronic homelessness. And I'm also finding great hope today in how community members are engaging personally with the challenge of homelessness, not only with their dollars and donations, but in their willingness to see that our community's future is wound tightly together with that of our neighbors who are surviving on the margins. A business owner recently shared with me that she sees her own success as tied to the stability and health of the individuals who sleep in the doorway of her shop. She didn't say, that success depended on removing them from our neighborhood, but in their stability and their health. Community members like her are rejecting punitive and superficial approaches that only address the visibility of homelessness in favor of solutions that help our neighbors escape it. Changing lives requires compassion, consistency, and traveling alongside someone as they get connected to the services they need. That's what Multnomah County does, and that's what we will continue to do as we transform and strengthen the ways in which we serve those who are hurting the most. For decades, Multnomah County's public health has quietly, reliably, and effectively prevented disease and deaths in our community. But what's often gone unnoticed is all the work surrounding disease prevention, health education, outreach, harm reduction, and so much more. Well, that is until this past year, when the pandemic threw a spotlight onto the breadth and depth of public health responsibilities. And to be honest, it's taken the past year for me to gain a better understanding of public health's reach. And I continue to be impressed and grateful for the wide ranging work they are doing to keep our community safer and healthier, whether we recognize it or not. As community members begin to wrestle with the lasting residual trauma of this once in a lifetime emergency, the work of public health will be critical to keeping people from plunging through the social fabric that has been frayed beyond our imagination. Through the work that they've done for years and the ways they've risen to the challenges of the pandemic, we have seen the transformative potential of a robust and ambitious system that creates healthier conditions for all residents and strengthens historically overlooked communities. That is the vision the county is committed to pursuing as we move forward, where every dollar that we invest in our programs and people returns as a healthier and safer county. Because health isn't just about keeping the community safe from viruses and treating wounds. As we've seen over and over again this past year, our community's health depends on addressing all the inequities that put people's health and lives at risk. So as we look forward, that means Multnomah County Public Health will be a crucial pillar in the work of confronting the community's biggest challenges, like housing instability, climate change, gun violence, and racism itself. All of these major challenges are direct legacies of systems that weren't designed to serve or benefit people of color. Multnomah County is creating pathways to build something better. But better is only possible when we build in a way that intentionally centers and partners with the communities who have historically borne the brunt of inequities and injustice. And at the same time, communities of color do not need the county to tell them what's wrong or how harms can be repaired. They already hold deep wells of wisdom and creativity brilliance and energy that when combined with the county's resources 
can translate our shared visions for equity, inclusion, and justice into reality. We've taken this approach as we crafted the plan, directing how the county should invest our supportive housing services funding, as we designed the Behavioral Health Resource Center service model, and as we built a COVID-19 response that prioritizes the needs of communities disproportionately impacted by the virus. This spirit of co-creation is essential to bringing equity to life, creating material change in the lives of those who have been harmed by systems built to oppress, to minimize, and to silence. It requires a more inclusive, intentional process, but at Multnomah County, we are as committed to doing things the right way as we are to doing the right thing. Equity and urgency are two sides of the same coin. For example, the voter-approved Preschool for All measure gives us the opportunity to build, for the first time, an early childhood education system that is created in partnership with families and communities who have been priced out and left out. With their leadership and partnership, we are building a new way of caring for and educating preschoolers where access and racial justice are foundational values. Meanwhile, we are using our Transforming Justice Initiative to envision and implement a new model of public safety that is decoupled from the history of institutionalized racism that the criminal legal system is founded on. But we're not doing it alone because we can't. In this process, we're elevating the voices of community members who have experienced firsthand the brutality and the harms of a system explicitly designed to oppress people of color. And together, we're poised to build a new model that promotes healing, stability, and true community safety. Multnomah County is also building equity through our budget which reveals what we value and aligns our community to the future we wish to build. But our values can't just live on paper. What we invest in must meaningfully improve the lives of our community members. For about a decade, the county has used our equity and empowerment lens to help us design our programs in a way that better connects our values to the real world differences we seek to make. And now we're applying that lens to our budgets so that every part of our organization, from transportation and IT to human services and health, plan, use, and measure the effect of their limited resources in a way that improves the lives of those we serve. We will use every tool we have to ensure that our work always pushes us closer to a future Multnomah County where we lift up every community member. Every challenge of the last year has been met by the dedication, ingenuity, and adaptability of Multnomah County's 6,000 employees. I am profoundly grateful to all of you. But I'm also aware that our staff can only show up as their best for the community to embody equity, justice, and inclusion when they experience those values in their own workplace. So I'm committed to ensuring that the county's workforce equity strategic plan remains fully supported as we take steady steps towards becoming an organization that practices our values inside and out. I know that we are all eager to leave behind the events of the last year. But at Multnomah County, we're using the lessons of this unique moment in our community story to build the just and equitable community that I know we can be. And I hope you'll join us as we build it together. Finally, one of the things I am the most grateful for is to lead a board that brings such a diversity of professional experience, expertise, and passion forward on the behalf of the people of Multnomah County. So today, for the first time in the history of this speech, I've asked each of my colleagues, Commissioners Sharon Myron, Sushila Jayapal, Jessica Vega-Peterson, and Lori Stegman to reflect on their priorities. Despite being in crisis management mode, this year Multnomah County has done important, visionary work. We now must focus on what our community needs for the future, recovery, resiliency, and reimagined systems. 
of paramount importance, we must act on a shared vision to address our homeless crisis. We have a historic opportunity to provide safety and stability for people who are houseless at this unprecedented moment in time. We need to get this right. In particular, we must invest in services that urgently reduce harm for people living unsheltered and in the broader community while we're working on those longer term solutions to prevent and end homelessness for good. And part of this long term work is addressing critical deficits in our system of behavioral health care. It's not just a matter of more services, it's really a matter of better systems. Filling gaps will not fix an under resourced, poorly designed and poorly managed system. But working together to create and resource a better system will change lives, especially as we're facing the profound isolation, school closures, job loss, and untold trauma stemming from COVID. We must also continue our work to re-envision law enforcement and community safety, particularly where the criminal legal system intersects with behavioral health and houselessness. I championed an effort looking at people who frequently come into contact with multiple systems, including emergency housing, so our shelters, also ERs and jail. This showed shocking disconnection and overlap. Our multi-layered, uncoordinated responses aren't working to address root problems, and those who are most vulnerable suffer as a result. This year, I'm excited to advance this intersectional work and carry forward key recommendations from this quality data and powerful collaboration across sectors. Our work is not just about getting through COVID, but it's about moving forward with renewed determination and ensuring that our entire community will thrive. Two themes have risen loud and clear from the past year racial justice, and interconnectedness. The pandemic and the movement for racial justice have forced us to confront the systemic inequities faced by Black, Indigenous, and other people of color. And they have shown us that we are all interconnected. Combined, they have shown us that the health and well-being of any one of us is literally dependent on the health and well-being of the rest of us. I'll be carrying these themes with me into the next year with a focus on three particular areas. First, I'll continue to advocate for an equitable response to the pandemic, equitable access to testing, vaccine, and the resources necessary to helping our families, businesses, and neighborhoods emerge strong and resilient. And I'll work to ensure that we implement the lessons we've learned about the ways in which our systems have failed those community members most at risk. My second priority will be successful implementation of our groundbreaking supportive housing services measure. This will require clarity, transparency, responsiveness, and accountability. And at the same time as we're developing those long-term solutions, we also need to respond to what we see on the streets right now by providing a continuum of options that meets people experiencing houselessness where they are and with what they need. And third, community violence is also a public health imperative, particularly for the black and brown communities most impacted. I'll work with partners on neighborhood focused strategies to prevent and respond to violence, while continuing our work on the broader revisioning of public safety systems that's taking place at the state and local levels. I'm honored to serve with this dedicated board of commissioners to lead us through these challenging times. In November, voters approved Preschool for All, a historic investment in our children, working families, teachers, and small business owners. The measure, which will total over $300 million in annual spending when fully implemented, was years in the making. And the components of Preschool for All are central in my attempt to build a more equitable society. Preschool for All addresses the growing wealth inequality in our community by taxing the most wealth. It also pumps that money back into the salaries of teachers and assistants who are too often underpaid and unable to make ends meet. And it lifts an enormous burden, often well over $1,000 per month from the budgets of working families. 
It uplifts small business owners, who are often women and women of color, that operate the preschools and childcare that form the backbone of our local economy. And finally, it centers racial equity. From the concept to the policies to implementation, Preschool for All is deeply rooted in the experience of black and brown and all communities of color. Preschool for All must be implemented properly, which is why over the next year, I'll continue to work hard in partnership with this board to make sure the program is successful and enrolling children by the fall of 2022. The values and community-centered process of Preschool for All is reflected in the work I do on the other critical issues facing our community, public safety reform, housing instability, and environmental justice. We can build on this accomplishment and do much, much more to build the equitable society we all deserve. We have all been through so much together this past year, but despite those challenges, I could not be more proud of how Multnomah County and our employees stepped up every time. Einstein said that in the midst of every crisis lies great opportunity. I believe we've been presented with rare opportunities that will serve as the foundation of the transformational change that we so desperately need. This board stands ready to do the hard work at hand. And together, I look forward to continuing the economic mobility work that I've been focusing on for the past four years. I believe that poverty is at the root of many of our social and economic challenges. By identifying and analyzing geographic and social influences, we can better develop policies that increase mobility. Evidence-based data like this effort my office has led, helps us strategize, plan, and allocate our limited resources to do the greatest good. From building a flagship library in Gresham to establishing a school-based health center at Reynolds High School, to citing a vaccine distribution location at Gresham High School, to distributing $1 million to East County businesses with priority given to BIPOC and women-owned businesses. As we begin to recover from this pandemic, I am optimistic because I know that by working together, our values, not our circumstances, will define us and set us on the path forward. Thank you for joining us for the 2021 State of Multnomah County. Hi everyone, I am Rachel Solitaroff from Central City Concern. Welcome to the continuation of our State of the County program with a conversation with Chair Deborah Kafori. Um, before we dive in, we're gonna take a moment for a short sponsor break. It's only human to pursue the elusive, while also capturing the possibilities, even something like CO2. Over the last decade, Chevron has spent over $1 billion on carbon capture projects and is investing in startup companies working to transform carbon into new forms of energy. Great. Well, welcome back, everyone. And as we resume our conversation with Chair Kafori, I'll remind you it's not too late to ask a question. You can tweet it um, at City Club using the hashtag State of the Possible or email your questions to questions at pdxcityclub.org. Great. Well, 
Welcome, Chair Kofori. Great to see you. We've been talking, but it's good to see you on here, here in person. Um, we don't have a ton of time this afternoon, so let's just dive right in um, and start out with a, uh, an easy topic, which is our, our state of emergency of homelessness. And your video, which thank you for that. I thought it was really beautifully done. And it spoke really elegantly about addressing homelessness with, I love this pairing, with consistency and compassion. Um, and, and you and the commissioners also talked about the strategy of safe, affordable housing combined with services. Can you, can you dive into that strategy in a bit more detail, give us a bit more sense of the, the contours of it? And, and thinking also about how as county chair, you actually oversee a number of departments which are really instrumental in addressing root causes of homelessness across behavioral health, criminal justice, human services, public health. How do those come to bear upon your strategy and solutions? Well, thank you, Rachel, for um, being here today for this. And I want to thank the City Club for, for doing the annual State of the County, although it looks a little different this year. Um, this, this question, we could spend an entire uh, you know hour just talking about uh, what yeah. the county is doing. I will say, and, you, and I appreciate the work that you and Central City have done as well as one of our trusted community partners. We know that housing ends people's homelessness. But it's not just housing only, it's housing plus services. For so many people, it's not just enough to have the keys to an apartment. They need, they need the supportive services that help keep them in that housing. And at the county, you're, you're correct, we do a lot of that work here. And that's one of the reasons why um, we partnered with Clackamas in Washington County to pass the Metro-wide um, services measure because we also know that there's not the jurisdictional boundaries. Um, people move across our community wherever they can find affordable rent. Um, and, and we've already started the work. These dollars are not going to come online until July 1, even though voters voted on it in May. Um, we started working immediately here at the county, um, especially I want to call out uh, two of our leaders, departmental leaders. Um, Erica Pruitt, who leads the Department of Community Justice, and Ebony Clark, who leads the Health Department, which also includes the, our Behavioral Health um, Division. And they've come together from the beginning, working with the Joint Office to craft a plan that's going to be ready to go on July 1st. Yeah, it's terrific. And you, you know, besides just those um, different departments within the county, you have their partnerships with other counties. There's the entity of Metro, there's the city of Portland, and now Commissioner Ryan is overseeing the Bureau of Development Services and the Housing Bureau, as well as being assigned the joint office. Um, there's our business community, our coordinated care organizations. What's your, how are you thinking in your planning and your visioning for the future about the um, sort of co that collective whole, that integration of different stakeholders and frankly, um, service providers or funders um, in the in the solution as you conceptualize it. Yeah, well, we've we've actually been preparing for this for years. I mean, it started with the Joint Office of Homeless Services, which is the city of Portland and Multnomah County. It's also incorporated into a home for everyone, which is our countywide plan um, that also includes you know, hundreds of community members, business community, philanthropic community, the, the providers, and, and almost, I would say most importantly, people who, who have experienced or are experiencing homelessness themselves. Mm -hmm. And so the, the, the housing services measure um, really smartly looks to the counties to develop their, their local improvement plans. And mm -hmm. Um, our plan was was adopted by the Metro Council just just recently, and that plan has been months of conversations with with folks from a, such a broad background to really get at what are we going to do? What's Multnomah County's goals? What are Multnomah County's objectives? And how are we going to work with community to end people's homelessness? Yeah, that's interesting. So really, it's because I think the question around accountability, particularly around the support of housing services measure um, comes up appropriately so, and, and we would all want to embrace that. So sort of, I think you just touched on this, but just to double down, who would you, when we think about the complexity of the problem and the number of players, who 
who has that, or, and you can even vision this in the future, it doesn't have to be right now, um, but who has that accountability to truly drive population level reductions in homelessness? And how, how would they know that they're succeeding? And if you, were, if you were to visualize that in the future. Well, one of the things that makes this so complex is that there are so many different entities that have a role. And I would say we're all accountable. That being said, I know that uh, you know this this measure is a lot of money. It's a it's a new a new bold ambitious um, vision for our community, and um, the public deserves to to have answers. They deserve to be able to find a place where they can go on the internet, click on a website, and see actual numbers for how things are going, how many people are getting out of homelessness, how many people are involved in services which programs are working, how those are changing and adapting. And that is what I envision is, is a, a wave so that the public can see on, a, on you know, an immediate, at immediate notice how things are going and how their dollars are being put to use. Because um, you know, we, we made a promise to the community that, that this money would help people and we intend to fulfill that promise. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great vision. I think particularly that transparency and that accessibility. Um, switching gears for a moment, I, I was also um, really moved in the video by the red thread of equity and racial justice woven throughout every, every almost every comment made. And I and a lot of my colleagues have really long appreciated the county's leadership um, in leading with race and centering race in ensuring anti-racism um, is acted out in values and practice. And I know we're looking forward. We'll do that in a second. But can you talk with me a bit about what you see is in your work as as chair and in your time at the county areas where you have felt uh, real success in that work? but also some areas where you've stumbled. Um, dismantling systemic racism is, is the most important work that we're doing at Multnomah County. And it's both internal, it's uh, focusing on our employees um, because as I've said in my speech, our employees can't show up each day with their best selves and help community at, in, at the most difficult times, if they themselves are not having that same uh, treatment at work, if they're not experiencing safety, trust, and belonging in the workplace, then then they're not going to be able to um, to be there to be you know all they can be in the public. So we have a workforce equity strategic plan, which um, we set in place a couple of years ago. It's um, involving especially. It's, it's from the ground, coming from the ground up. I mean, we looked to employees from all levels of our county so that they're, they're bought in. They, this is a created plan alongside with people at work in the county. And we use that same vision as we look to our, our, our services outward facing. Um, using an, an equity and empowerment lens is, is a different way of doing business. We're looking to our community for answers and for solutions and to walk alongside us in this process. It's not um, Multnomah County describing or outlining how to, to fix our community. It's our community coming to us and saying, we are gonna co-create the answers together. And I think for me, um, one of the things that's that's been, um, for me personally, that's been the hardest is learning to slow down. Um, there are there's a lot of problems out there, and I just want to I want to get in there and fix it all. But to do things it, the right way and to do things in a meaningful, long lasting way, you really have to involve the community. Um, one of the things I'm most proud of is that over the past three years, we have increased the amount of dollars that we use that we're spent sending to culturally specific organizations um, by about 80 percent. And we know that, that those are the organizations that are working on the ground, trusted community partners who deliver their services in a way that, that is, is successful and is also meaningful, much more meaningful. 
Yeah, it's great. It's such a fertile area to talk about because um, I want to pull in a couple audience questions. And one of them, I think, using that, using the description that you just um, describe again, and that idea of equity and urgency being two time two sides of the same coin. Um, bearing that in mind as I ask this question. So one of the questions from the audience was, um, are there plans to treat the mental health crisis in Multnomah County? And if so, what are they? And I'll, I'll ask you that. And I kind of ask it on purpose after you gave that really elegant description of, of co-creation and of slowing down to to ultimately go fast? Well, one of the um, ways that we are going to address and are addressing um, the crisis of, of mental health in our community is, is that supportive services um, ballot measure that we've talked a lot about. But I'll give an, another example, and that is um, in the, had some photos in the video of our Behavioral Health Resource Center. And this is um, something that our community has asked for for years a place where people can go to come off the street at, and be safe and be surrounded by people who have been through or who are going through what they are going through. And so maybe it's someone that comes in just because they need a warm blanket and they need a place to feel safe or because they're ready to engage in services and they um, want to talk with people about how that can happen or they need a, a place to lay their head at night. That's, that's safe and, and, um, and again, is surrounded with people who, who know and understand what, what they're going through. And that means that there are, there are peers, peer deliver, delivered services. And I wanna give you a shout out at Central City Concern because you've obviously been a leader in this area. It's, it's much different to walk into a facility where there's um, people who have fancy degrees or who have read a lot of books. It's another thing to walk into a facility that's being run by people who've who have been through what you're going through. And that's the model that we're incorporated in this, in this facility. And that's not an idea that came, you know, from me or from my colleagues, that's an idea that came from community. Yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. And I think really then can help. It's that sort of um, elemental engagement moment where of meeting someone where they are um, and then kind of bringing, addressing their needs as they arise. Um, your, the video also spent, you spent a nice amount of time talking about public health and this idea of public health is kind of the humble yo people kind of slogging away for decades. And, and you noted public health now as being much more visible in the public eye, but also now looking to the future being, I think your words were a, a crucial pillar in the work of confronting the community's biggest challenges gun violence, housing instability, climate, um, climate change, racism. Can you talk to me, us about that a bit more? What does that mean to really view something through a public health lens? And then we can sort of even vision that out in the future a little bit. Yeah, that's a great question. I think people are throwing that phrase out a lot these days is, yeah. um, you yeah. know, racism is a public health issue. Gun violence is a public health issue. Climate change is a public health issue, and, and they're all true. But what I think the difference that um, that using a public health approach, it's saying that the answer isn't going to be found in a specific program or in, in an individual behavior. It's a more holistic approach. And I'll, I'll give you an example. For instance, when, you, when we talk about gun violence in our community, which is really uh, devastating and impactful, especially at this moment in time, um, it's you, applying a public health lens means that you're not just you're not just focused on, well, we got to lock them up or we got to get the guns out of their hands of, of individuals. It's looking at upstream. It's looking um, to early childhood education. It's involving um, people who are out in the community working with youth to um, youth who are feeling disenfranchised. It's it's addressing racism. It's providing jobs and helping people get stable housing. That is the continuum of, of how we're going to, as a community, address gun violence. And that is using a public health approach. Yeah. Do you envision then? Oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead. 
Well, do you envision then a different level of investment in public health or is it more just taking that approach and saying, can we all, um, can we all own that approach as part as we look at how to solve problems? Or do you actually envision a public health department in the future that has um, more robust capabilities to really help support that broad range of initiatives? I think it's both. I mean, I don't, we at Multnomah County, we're used to stretching the taxpayer's dollar and getting the most out of, out of our limited resources. So I know that we're never gonna be at a place where we're gonna say, oh, public health is fully funded and we can do everything we need to be able to to tap into to different services in different areas and i do believe that we have and this sounds kind of cheesy but it's true we have the collective knowledge here in our community we know we know what to do we just need to do it and we need to bring everyone together um, all the different entities that i talked about because it isn't just you know, it's not just one answer. There's there's a whole approach, and we really need to involve community in that conversation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, trying to decide which place to go here. Let's let's follow up on the public safety conversation since you brought up um, gun violence specifically, and we did get a question from the um, from the audience, and I'll I'll read it because I don't want to screw it up. Um, our low income and multiracial neighborhoods have been quickly deteriorating due to an unprecedented rise in crime. Shortly before this surge began, you stated in a monthly newsletter that the jail population in Multnomah County had been reduced without any increase in crime. And the person asked, could you reevaluate that statement here with us today? Yeah, there's a there's a lot in that question. Um, hmm. Actually, and I know people don't want to hear this, but if you look at the crime statistics, we aren't seeing a huge uptick in crime. We are seeing, yes, it's true, a, an unprecedented level of of gun violence in our community, which um, we talked a little about w ways to address that, and it's definitely not going to be an overnight fix. But putting people in jail is not going to solve the problem. Um, jail is our most expensive tool that we have, and it's an important one. It needs to be used wisely. Uh, on top of that, we have the COVID pandemic that we've been living through in the past year. And knowing that um, because of data and science and, and our fabulous public health team, Congregate living facilities are hotbeds for COVID spread. And that's why the minute COVID hit our community, we quickly moved to, um, to move people, separate people physically distance within the congregate living facilities, but also um, add you know, additional PPE, um, ways to keep people safe. And part of that was to decrease the census of people who are in our jails for reasons other than, than violent crime. And um, so the fact that we did decrease the number of people in jail and it hasn't resulted in a huge uptick in crime in the community is, I would say, shows us that jail being one piece of it, again, we need to focus on the other areas. We need to focus on mental health care. We need to focus on ending racism in our community. We need to look at getting people housed. There was a, a recent study that was in the Oregonian, um, published in the Oregonian, which showed that the sheer, the vast number of people in our jail who are homeless. Mm -hmm. Now, that shows to me that um, we jail is not the answer. It's not the only answer. And it's something that we've been working on for a long time and will continue to work on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a pretty, it's remarkable. Those things all it, they tie together into a set of common root causes and sort of taking an approach around um, prevention and looking at those root causes. Um, putting a public health lens on yeah, all of these issues. Yeah, you're right. Yeah. 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 yeah, there's a real there a lot of factors, but they're all the same factors. You know, poverty, racism, mental health issues, yeah. alcohol and drugs. Um. Coming back to the that public health lens specifically, um, t 
talk to us a bit about the county's role in vaccine distribution. We did get a, uh, a question asking, um, why doesn't Multnomah County ask for a pause in offering the vaccine to more groups while the backlog from previous groups is monumental? The person stated each Monday it becomes the Hunger Games as more and more people compete for limited appointments. So can you talk to us a bit like what specifically is the uh, is the county's role in setting that vaccine strategy? And then what have you done with that, um, that role that you have? That is another great question. And there, there's a lot of confusion out there. And I, I first of all, want to acknowledge that people um, have been waiting for this vaccine for a long time and, and everyone is, it, people are ready to go to get vaccinated. And I, I, I'm sorry that it's taking so long to get it through. But Multnomah County's role is to fill in the gaps in a larger vaccine strategy. We don't make the decisions regarding the vaccine allocation. That is, that's a decision that's handled at the state level. So our, what, how we view our role, as I said, is to fill in the gaps. So um, through our local public health authority, we are aggressively using the small share of vaccines that we receive to reach people at the highest risk of getting sick and dying. Yeah. And um, so what we're, we're focusing on, on communities of color, we're focusing on um, people who have been disproportionately hit by the virus itself. And that using our equity and empowerment lens that I talked about earlier and focusing on community, we have learned so much in how to deliver vaccines. It's not just about setting up a big site and having a bunch of people come, which which works for a lot of people. But for our community, we've learned that we need to do more. We need to look at um, where these, where these um, facilities are located. We need to focus on in each county and areas. We use the data and, and overlaid the um, zip codes where people have been hardest hit. And we were setting up clinics in those communities with community-based organizations so that we have those trusted relationships and those community partners. Because there are a lot of people out there who are scared. They don't trust government, they, and rightfully so. So they need their community to tell, to help them, you know, to tell them, to guide them in the right direction. People told us that they need transportation. Folks who are, who are home, um, people living in adult care homes, they don't, they don't have a car to drive downtown to downtown Portland or um, to get someplace to get to get vaccinated. Um, you know, there's so many, so many elements to this question as well. Uh, we oh, also answers. run. Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Keep going. No, keep going. This is great. Sure. We also run, um, you know, clinics. We have the largest um, federally qualified health clinic system in the state of Oregon. 60,000 people in Multnomah County use uh, county health clinics for their um, for their health care. And um, as of March 3rd, we had 60% of the vaccines, 67% of the vaccines that we've had went to in BIPOC individuals and 51% of those were non-English speakers. So the clinics are, are trusted community partners as well, and they're able to get um, vaccine out to, to their folks. That's great. We've been really fortunate to partner with you all on that work of setting up some of the it's in some of the satellite sites. It's been wonderful. We don't have a ton of time. I did want to. This is going to seem uh, <laughs> specious, but talk a bit about um, economic issues. Um, and I'll just point to one, for instance. Sorry, I'm in the heart of Old Town, so mass transit makes a lot of noise in the background. Um, one in particular is the economic cliff that huge numbers of people may face when the statewide eviction, eviction moratorium expires in June. Um, and how do you see the county supporting um, or partnering to help with folks who are going to be experiencing that really terrifying moment? From, um, from the beginning, of this crisis, uh, Multnomah County moved very quickly to ensure that we had a an eviction moratorium here and push the state to, to do one at the state level. 
because the last thing you need while there's a pandemic is people losing their homes. And we know, um, we've been saying this for years, that housing is health. So people need to, when you tell people to stay home, they need to have a home to stay in. So keeping people housed during this pandemic, um, and that one of the ways of doing that is to put an eviction moratorium in place. Um, unfortunately, I don't think anyone predicted that we would be in this crisis as long as we have been. And um, the economy has has not gotten back to where, where folks have the ability to, are gonna have the ability to pay back all that rent. So continuing to, um, to keep that eviction moratorium in place and then to have a grace period just yesterday, I testified in front of the uh, Senate Housing Committee about the need for the state to, to realize that we need time. We know that the federal government is going to uh, allocate additional resources for, um, for rent assistance, which is crucially needed. But we're going to need time to, to get the money and to get it out to people who need it. And, and that's going to take longer than, than June 30th. And in addition, we'll need to have a grace period because people aren't going to be able suddenly on July 1st to have all the money to pay back their back rent. And um, we did do, a, I, I think, a, a really good job um, in 2020 with getting the resources out to community. We had about 20, $25 million that we put out in the community for rent assistance. Uh, but we're gonna, we're, we know we, we need much more, more than that moving forward. Yeah, yeah, and that that's not something that our county is going to be able to marshal. So it's like those additional resources. I'm not an economist, so I almost hesitate to ask this question. <laughs> I'm far far from it. Um, <laughs> but um, there is also, you know, you're the video referenced a number of really visionary and kind of unprecedented investments in preschool for all in the support of housing services measure, um, the library bond. Um, we do hear from some parts of the community that we are asking a lot of them in terms of higher property taxes, higher income taxes. And do you see any any short or long-term risk there? You know, how, how would you respond to folks who say these taxes may have a negative long-term effect on, on economic growth in the region? Well, I'm not an economist either, but I will say that um, at least the, the measures that Multnomah County played a role in, we're, we, we built these measures with community input. So we went to all, all sectors of the community, including the business community, including, um, you know, actually we, we spent a lot of time with, you know, these are measures that came from the, from community members to us. And so I believe that they were done in a way that doesn't put a, a disproportionate harm on one particular sector of our community. Um, and I think that the services that we're going to invest in will pay off in the future. And the, you know, we're paying right now for the impact of not having early childhood education for all children. When we have, you know, folks who don't graduate from high school who aren't able to get jobs, um, we, we are paying right now for uh, the homelessness crisis on our streets where people are going from the emergency room into jail and back and forth. And that, that all costs money. So using taxpayer dollars in a smart strategic sense, which is what these measures are doing, will have, and I believe, long-term um, implications for the betterment of our community. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Oh my gosh. Well, time time's really flown here. Um, I have one last question for you. Before I ask it, um, I want to thank you, Chair Kafori, and not just for thanks for being with us for this hour, but literally for your leadership. I think we ask a ton of our leaders. We rarely stop to thank them. And then as things get more demanding and intense, um, we demand even more and we thank even less. And I don't want to presuppose anything on the part of the community, but I'll, I'm going to do it anyway. Thank you um, for being our leader um, during this time. I really, really want you to hear that. And it's That's a little bit of a me, personal. I would say, I hope my children are watching so that they can hear <laughs> that. <laughs> 
that's right. Oh, yeah. My- yeah, this is a lesson. <laughs> this is a lesson for many different um, environments. Um, before we wrap up, just it's a little bit of a personal question, but what what strengths in the last year? What strengths in yourself have you really drawn on to to support yourself in in leading through this time? And then what are some new strengths that weren't there, but that you've realized you, you had to develop to, to lead our county? I would, I mean, I, I talked about my, my family just a little bit, but my family has helped get me through. I think the strength of our community, when I see Multnomah County's 6,000 employees who show up for work every day, um, who not only work their day-to-day jobs, but then they are volunteering in our severe weather shelters when we have the worst snow and ice storm in, in the past 40 years. Looking to 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 the, to them, I'm I'm so I'm just I'm honored. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> it's been a long year. <laughs> I'm honored to to get to work with folks in Multnomah County. And um I guess what I've, one of the other things that I've learned is that, well, and I'll, I'll credit Commissioner Jayapal because she did say this in her, in her, um, in the speech that we hear from her, all of our um, futures are tied in each other. So if someone is out there suffering, then that hurts me mm-hmm. and not just in a, in a painful way, but my success our our success and the success of our entire community depends on us working together and to ensuring that every person is able to thrive well we're a few minutes past i think there's no better place to end um and then there so thank you so much for your for your leadership for your time um I also wanna thank the City Club of Portland for hosting us, for Bobby Regan, who helped to facilitate and bring us all together. Thanks again, Chair Kofori. Have a great weekend and have a great afternoon, everyone.